as much as I like old software, I think I like old hardware more because there's something tactile to it. Software is cool, but software is software. Hardware is something you can touch and feel. And so the thing I'm gonna show you today is not that terribly special in a lot of senses, but I think it's super cool. I always wanted one. It's something I've wanted my entire life. My parents had something like this when I was a child and I never got to use it. It was off limits to me. Of course, they didn't use it either, which is the nature of a lot of these things, but we'll get into that. So here we go. In the days before flatbed scanners, we had palm scanners like this one. The classic one, I think, the one I see more of is the, I think, ScanMan Pro, or just the straight ScanMan. And that was an archaic instrument and one that I'm not all that interested in. It does give you the cool, you know, ultra aesthetic bitmap, dithered scans of everything, but you can't do that much with that other than get nice aesthetic dithered pictures of things. And I can get those by processing stuff with other software considering that it gives you a picture of something that's exactly what you would get from scanning on a flatbed scanner anyway. This one interests me more for a couple reasons. First, those older bitmap black and white scan mans, scan men, scans man, those required a special ISA card to in the machine to interface with the device. The problem with that is I only have so many ISA slots, I don't like opening the machine up, I don't like playing the IRQ game, so I didn't want to get one of those and have to go through all that just to use it once or twice or have it sit in my computer forever taking up a slot just in case I decided to you know get a yen to play with it again. And if I put it in a bag and put it in the closet, I'm never going to take it out just to play with it. And that's all these things are good for really is playing with them. So I didn't want to get a piece of stuff that was just going to sit on my shelf forever and not be something I could drag out to show to friends or if I got, you know, a bug in my ass to do something interesting with it. I'd like something I can actually use. I try to do that with all my stuff is get stuff I'm actually going to touch, actually going to use, actually going to enjoy. I try to do it with everything I have, in fact. I'm not really a collector so much as I am just a gigantic nerd who's trying to live in 1990. So what I like about this one in that regard is that this one connects to the parallel port. It doesn't use a special card. And that means I can use it on any computer, really. I mean, I think my i7 might even have a parallel port. It's possible I could get this working on Windows 7. But I'm going to use it on what it requests on the back, which is an IBM PC or compatible with 4633 or higher processor and Windows 95. Well, I have Windows 98. That should be close enough. I'm not doing an unboxing. I'm just going to show you the thing. All right. Now, first off, if you've ever seen a Logitech ScanMan before, I don't know. You, you might think this is a little big. I mean, it's big. It's... It's as big as my head. Now, what's interesting about that is I don't actually know what type of document this is meant to scan. I mean, it's no size in particular. I mean, that's not eight and a half inches and it's certainly not 11. So I'm not really sure what this was supposed to scan. I think maybe you're just supposed to scan business cards and postcards and maybe like make multiple passes of things this way or that way. I, I don't know. Um, maybe it says so in the online help. This didn't come with a manual, so I don't know. Uh, it's been used, it's not brand new, so unfortunately it didn't include something crucial, which is the power supply. So to that end, uh, I'm probably gonna have to crack this to figure out what it takes. Oh, holy hell, 15 volts? Oh, I can't do that. I don't have 15 volts. Fuck. Um, I might have something higher or lower though. So let's go ahead and crack this open, see what's inside and maybe crack that open and see what's inside. And maybe we'll find out that we can put something higher in there or maybe even something lower. God, that sucked getting that open. I think I actually had to break it. So I'm gonna have to glue it back together. Good God, this is surprisingly dense. I would have assumed that most of the circuitry, most of the actual smarts and, and whatnot were in that thing, but there's a lot going on in here. Holy crap. This is a Logitech branded IC. So, I mean, custom, presumably. And there we have a 12 volt regulator. So that explains why it wants 15 volts in because it has to have a couple extra volts to regulate down to 12. So that sucks because that means we cannot run this off of uh, 12 volts. But if we have anything 15 or above, it'll work fine. So we can do that. Yeah, so what's interesting is that this chip, when I Google it, returns nothing. All I get is spew. A million datasheet sites that claim to have it, but don't. Same thing goes here. It's a nothing chip. Doesn't exist. So that sucks as far as knowing how this thing works. But, I mean, who gives a shit? We know how it works. That's a parallel thing, and that's some sort of microprocessor. Okay, done. 
let's put it back together. That's the thing. When you get up into the more sophisticated gadgets, you know, not just a simple analog amplifier or whatever, there's no longer such a thing as how does it work. It does. It just does. It's got lots and lots and lots of stuff in it. And all those things are black boxes and you just have to accept it. And you're not going to repair it and you're not going to be able to deduce how it works enough to modify it or anything. It just, it is what it is and it either works or it doesn't. And if it breaks, you throw it away. And yeah, it appears they glued this. So I'm going to have to tape it back together. We're going to use a little bit of medical tape. Why am I using medical tape? Well, I recommend it for all your electronics applications, as long as you're not dealing with high voltage. Here's the reason why. It's very easy to tear. And it tears cleanly. So you're not going to be fighting with it like you do with electrical tape, trying to get it to tear and just stretching it. It doesn't leave a completely disgusting residue on things. I mean, it'll leave some, but not like electrical tape, that horrible vinyl crap that will leave scum that you cannot clean off on anything. Also, electrical tape doesn't hold up under heat at all. And I mean, I don't understand who's buying this stuff. It doesn't work. It it just doesn't work. It's a non-product. You put, I don't know, 90 degrees on top of electrical tape, the shit starts melting and just slides off on its own, leaving a disgusting trail of slime behind. I, I don't, who's been buying this stuff for decades? I, I have no idea. Stop buying it. It's terrible. I mean, yeah, it insulates, but you don't need to insulate 5 volts or 12 volts better than this stuff does, unless you're dealing with high current. If you're dealing with high current, don't fucking tape it. Use a wire nut, use a solder joint and some heat shrink, you know, be a grown up about it. Also, you don't want the paper stuff, you want the plastic fabric stuff. All right, and I went to my other room, dug through my power supplies, and I found this guy here, which provides 16 volts, so this'll work. Yes, it's a volt above the 15 specified. If you're new to my channel, or if you just haven't happened to watch my past videos about this, this device contains a voltage regulator. You remember when I said 7812 when I was looking inside of it? The 7812 is a standard component. It's in millions and millions and millions of electronic designs. It's been around for decades and decades. It is a positive voltage regulator. And the way it does that is you put a voltage into it that is at least two to three volts above what it's going to put out. A 7812 puts out 12 volts. So you need about 14, 15 volts. Hence the rating on here. That's the minimum plus a little bit for safety margin. And then in order to get down to the voltage in question, it compares the input voltage to an internal reference, which I've never understood how that works. And then it drops a certain amount of voltage in order to get down to the expected output voltage. It does this by essentially just running it through an electric heater for all intents and purposes. I mean, that's what a resistor is. And these are resistive voltage regulators. So as a result, that device gets hot. But that's okay, it's attached to a heat sink, it'll be fine. The great thing about these devices is that they can take something like 23 volts over their output voltage and regulate it down. That means you don't need to be super picky about what you put into them, as long as it's the right polarity, which I'll show you in a second, and it's not too high above the voltage that it's supposed to put out, it'll work. The problem is that the more voltage you put in, the more heat it'll dissipate. This device here is meant to dissipate about three volts, that's fine. It's set up for that. It could also dissipate a little bit more. An extra volt won't make a difference. But if you put 24 volts into this, although it would work, it would fail pretty quickly. And when I say pretty quickly, we might be talking about six hours or six days or six months instead of 25 years like it should last. You don't want to go too hog wild with what you put into a voltage regulator if the thing isn't really well cooled. And if you don't know what you're doing, don't risk it. You also can't assume that every device has a voltage regulator, but a ton of them do. So as long as you verify that it's in there, you can get away with a couple extra volts. And most devices do have them, but it is worth it to check. All right, so this should do it. Let's go ahead and plug it in. All right, just real quick to verify. See that symbol there? The plus pointing to the inner part of the double circle? That means the center of the connector on this power supply is positive voltage, and the outside is ground. If we look at this device here, we see, although it's a little different, the schematic is exactly the same. Positive goes in the center. That's good. That means this power supply and this device are the same polarity. If the middle was pointing to the negative, plugging this device into this power supply would blow it up. It might literally burst in your hand. Never do that. As a reminder, a tremendous number of things, almost everything nowadays, are center positive, but there are a lot of exceptions, and the further back you go, the more common they are. Boss and Roland audio equipment, for instance, and a lot of Casio, but not all, is all center negative. 
If you plug the wrong thing in, you will blow them up instantly. So please be careful. Please check your input voltage and polarity. Also, for anyone who has watched my channel before, yes, I'm going to give this spiel every time I plug in a power supply that's not designed for the device in question. I don't want anyone to have a bad time. All right, we ain't in a French restaurant, so no further au jus. And this ain't allergy season, so no further chew. Let's get this thing plugged in and see what it does. As always, when I'm plugging in a foreign power supply to an unknown device, no big bang, no breakers popped. Now, I don't know what this thing should do when I power it up. Maybe nothing. In order for a scanner of any kind to work, it has to have an illuminator inside. So I'm hoping when I plug it in, it'll turn that on. Well, nothing so far. All right. Doesn't smell like bang, so probably this thing needs to be plugged into the parallel port and the driver's loaded before it'll do anything. Well, this is installing, I'll tell you a little bit about this device. It might be obvious how it works, but I figure I should explain for anyone who's not familiar with this type. The sort of scanner that you're familiar with is a flatbed scanner. In that, you have a glass plate that you lay a piece of paper down on, and then underneath that, a head moves from left to right, scanning the paper while the paper remains stationary. That approach is very effective, but it's a pretty big device. It has a huge plate of glass, so it's pretty fragile, and it has motors that have to stay in sync and whatnot. The other thing about it is they're not very portable. So there's been a push over the decades, over and over and over and over and over. Companies keep trying to sell these products. Handheld, portable scanners. Now, nowadays, you might be familiar with this category of product in the form of business card scanners or the bar scanners. These all have motors in them, and the way they work is that you put a piece of paper into them, and then the motor pulls the paper through a pair of rubber rollers past the scan head. For some reason, and I'm not sure why this is, in the 90s, Logitech kept making these in this style, where there's no motor and you have to move the device yourself. I'm not really sure what the advantage is. I don't know why they didn't do it the other way. Maybe it costs more to manufacture. I don't know. This thing seems pretty complicated as is. Seems like adding a hobby motor and a rotary encoder would not have been that much to ask, especially as they have most of the parts here anyway. But anyway, that's how this product works. You move it manually. You put this on something you want to scan, and as you drag it down, the thing you're scanning rubs on this rubber roller. That rotates, and inside, a rotary encoder, which is a digital device that allows a computer to tell which direction and how fast a rotating axle is moving, tells the device how fast you're moving it, which it uses to regulate how quickly it reads lines out of the scanning head. The scan head, by the way, is a digital imager, much like the one in a digital camera, except instead of reading a patch of light in a square, it instead reads just one very long line. And then instead of taking a picture all at once, you take a series of pictures of one line at a time, moving the camera down, and then you reassemble them into an image of the object. So that's all this thing is. You just put it on things, hit the button, and drag it, and it scans. I just want to see how well it works and whether we could do some interesting shit with it. Okay, we've reached the critical part of the installation where it's going to try and connect to the scanner for the first time. So we're gonna plug our power in. All right, let's hit retry. Oh, it wants a calibration card. I don't have one of those. Maybe it will be okay with a white piece of paper. Oh, and it turned the light on, so I know it's talking to it. So we're going to press the scan button and then start dragging. This is not the correct calibration card. Well, I don't have the correct calibration card, sorry. Could try scanning an image that actually has details. We'll have to skip calibration. Oh, it's punted me into a tutorial. So this came with a copy of Adobe Photo Deluxe, which I think I remember being a terrible program. It came with my first digital camera in 2000, but I'm guessing it'll allow us to capture images because this thing is apparently Twain compatible, which means that any program that understands scanners of any sort can work with it. Scan Man Color 2000. Uh, okay, uh, okay, okay, so you can choose a mode and I'm kind of curious what that's gonna do I'm guessing if I put it in this mode or that mode It's gonna essentially make it look like what one of the earlier scan mans would look like but I'll do color This explains how you're supposed to use this to scan eight and a half by eleven pages that obviously can't fit under the scan head uh, You're expected to take multiple passes and stitch them together. Oh, and I guess that explains things the reason that this exists instead of an 8.5 by 11 flatbed is because they got to use a smaller CCD for this, so it's probably much cheaper to make. Okay, so we're gonna do top to bottom. All right, here we go. It's letting me know how fast I'm going and that I'm overrunning how quickly it can pull the data in over the parallel port. And frankly, I'm surprised it could do this at all. 
All right, so we got it, let's hit done here. There's our image. So obviously this looks a lot like you would expect an early flatbed scanner image to look. If you never owned one, they looked about this bad. Now it doesn't look bad, all things considered. Like it, it looks fairly representative of the picture. Obviously the um, tones have not been captured accurately, but it does look like the picture. So this is pretty low resolution. That's fine, that's not what I care about. Let's do another acquire. All right, so check this out. All right, so what we've done here is I fucked with the roller. By changing how the roller rolled and changing the direction that this rolled, I was able to fuck up the image in some pretty cool ways. So this gets us this neat slit scan effect. Here, let's zoom in. So you can see, compared to what I actually painted, this has been distorted pretty badly. Let's see what else we can do. All right, let's drag this around in a circle. And see what we got. Oh yes, that's very good. It seems like we can just keep scanning as long as we want. What if we just roll this like that? By manually rolling the roller, we can capture data without actually moving the device in a linear fashion. So if we put it on here like this at an angle, and then roll it while moving it, we can distort things however we like. Boy, that's a mess. I love it. Okay, now, I wasn't prepared for this. Do you see what it does here? It'll export to Amiga Holden Modify format. What the fuck? When's this from? 96. It must have just been a holdover from an earlier version of the software. Let's try this. Nope, it's not bright enough. Let's try this one. Okay, that was cool. Yeah, okay. I like that a lot. Especially these long streaks like this. The miscalibrated color gave it a neat hue too. Obviously, of course, we can do this. But then we can stop. And we can make some fucked up doom shit. Oh, you don't even have to do anything weird, really. Because the roller will move in either direction. See if it'll scan my phone. Oh yeah, there we go. Oh, that's very good. Honestly, having dicked with this for a while now, I'm starting to think to myself the value that it holds in terms of getting textures for 3D art. Well, that's a very tall image. Let's look at the other capture modes. What's this gray tones like? Probably just going to convert everything to grayscale. Yep, it's just grayscale, nothing special. Let's try line drawings. There we go. So that converted to black and white. Basically undithered though, it's pretty much just doing threshold which is not very interesting. Let's try that stitch feature and see what that's like. Do a color picture, auto stitch is on. Now I'm guessing it's gonna give me some very specific instructions about how to use this. Let's find out. By the way, I just wanna point out, trying as hard as I could, I was unable to keep this from wavering. This is the second pass, which I fucked up because I accidentally lifted the butt of this thing off. Let's see how auto stitch handles that. Auto stitch failed. Okay, let's try again. This thing just isn't sturdy enough for me to do this. Here's the label from some paper. 
Okay. Do another pass. Says it succeeded. All right. It looks like it worked. Let's see what we got. <laughs> it didn't work for shit. <laughs> this thing's snake oil. God, it did such a bad job. I don't know how it fucked this up. Now, one of my favorite features I've discovered about this, in the normal color mode, when you're scanning, as you're dragging it, it's letting you know how fast you're going if you need to slow down. And the reason for that is the parallel port is not a very fast communication device. It's just there was no USB in 1996, at least not widely available and not built into Windows and not built into most computers. So the parallel port was all they really had other than the serial port, which was pickier and not actually as fast for this sort of application. The parallel port is so slow that this thing can very easily overrun its capabilities. This has no real storage in it, probably only a simple shift register or a few kilobytes of memory, and it has to shift those out to the parallel port at a pretty low speed. If you move it too fast, the buffer on here or the buffer on the parallel port fills up. It no longer has anywhere to put new data, and so as you continue rolling, it's just throwing away data. It's the simple reality of dealing with moving a lot of data over a slow link, you have to buffer it. And since you have no ability to control the human hand, you have to give the user this biofeedback feature, this bar that tells you how fast you're going and whether you're getting close to the danger zone. That's the important part. That's what doesn't work in black and white mode. In color mode, as you're moving it, it says, okay, okay, okay. And as you move faster, it goes caution, caution, caution. When you move too fast, it says data lost, but they fucked up the drivers. In the line art mode, it doesn't do it correctly. When it loses data, it doesn't notice it and it just processes it as caution. So here's what that means. If I scan this at a reasonable speed, we get this picture of the leaf. Now let's go faster. Oops. It should have thrown that data away because it's clearly lost about 80% of the lines, but instead it just went ahead and put them on the screen. So what that means is if we go even faster, we almost completely destroy it, but it also means we can go at different speeds and we can fuck up the image. And of course it means we can go really fast and get some weird water ripple effects from Echo the Dolphin. So here's what's gonna happen. Um, this thing is too much fun to play with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut a hole in the top and I'm gonna put a little roller in there with a pulley on it so that you can access it from the top as you're scanning and override what this is doing. Slow it down or make it move faster. And that's gonna make this thing all sorts of fun. Maybe I'll do a video of that if I end up making that mod. In the meantime, I hope you had a good time. I realize I talked at great length about how scanners work, but I hope that's okay with you. And I hope you have a nice Thanksgiving because it's that time of year in America. And I'm not thankful for much the US has done, but I am thankful for my friends. And I'm thankful for all of you coming to this channel and paying attention to me. Thank you very much and I hope you have a good holiday.